Hello and welcome to Lore Watch, a roundtable freeform discussion about lore and our favorite media. I'm your host, Joe Perez, one of several lore-focused folks from Blizzard Watch, and I've got my stupendous co-host with me today, Matt Rossi. How you doing today, Matt? I got this tickle in my throat that's constantly threatening to come out in a huge burst of coughing every time I go to speak. So, yeah, it not is the best. It is the season for that. It really is. <laughs> Well, speaking of tickles and throats, we're going to be talking about, uh, well, it's a weird Nothing segue. Nothing to do with anything. <laughs> actually, no, it does. It actually does, because it's part of the story. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about the Vow Eternal short story today and possibly getting to some questions uh, as we have time, depending on. Mostly because this is a 35-page short story written by Christy Golden that actually gives us what Liz has been asking for uh, on our regular, pod- our regular pod- podcast show, as well as in our Discord channel and on Twitter, uh, which is getting to see a little bit of the wedding uh, between uh, Lothamar and Therissa. So... Uh, but before we get into that, I just want to make a little reminder out there that if you have questions, comments... Uh, or theme ideas for this podcast or any of our podcasts, be sure to send them into podcast at blizzardwatch.com. You can also send us uh, on Discord. We have a special channel set aside for our Patreon supporters as a way of saying thank you for your continued support, because without you, we truly would not be able to do this or even have the site up and running at all. Uh, If you can't support us on Patreon, we do understand that. Uh, And you can still support us in other ways, such as uh, making sure you share with your friends, giving out, uh, you know, reviews and, and letting people know that you enjoy our content. Uh, and if you have questions for us, and you don't want to send us an email you can go ahead and send them into our Q and podcast channel question or questions channel. Words are hard today, folks. I have not had nearly enough caffeine, but let's start by talking about what the vow eternal short story actually was. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a segue, right? Like this is one of those rare instances where usually we would get a, uh, pre-expansion novel, or at least that had been the the trend in the past. Uh, we got one with uh, Battle for Azeroth. We got one uh, before, eh, kind of midway through uh, Shadowlands, which unfortunately, and f- both fortunately and unfortunately, wasn't something that led us forward into the next expansion, but gave us more depth of what was happening in the expansion itself. So we got the Vow Eternal, which aims to bridge a little bit of the gap, but not a whole lot. Matt, what did you think of Vow Eternal? Must be nice having a big magic city. Didn't get burned down by the horde. So you can go have a big old wedding. Must be nice. That's it. That's all you're going to give me. That's all I'm giving you right now. If you want to talk specifics about the book, we can do that. But I mean, I'm sorry. This has been my big problem with uh, WoW for a couple of expansions now. And I want to move on. So I'm glad that we are moving on. I I am glad. Uh, I was a bit tantalized by the teaser that the elves are up to something, but we don't know what it is. I think we have an idea Uh, about that, which we'll probably talk about in a little while, because I think we talked about that a little bit after the expansion or after the uh, podcast last week. Maybe, uh, but regardless, I mean, I liked get, seeing Rathion get some development. Uh, I liked that the story recognized that Rathion is, did not get to be a whelp. He mm-hmm. just jumped straight into world saving time with, with a no experience. And yes, dragons have the ancestral memories, but that's almost more of a curse than a blessing for Rathion. As we see, um, he's got a real problem with what he quote unquote remembers. Uh, and This is, I'm going to say up front, he's not, you know, controlled by the old gods. He's not insane or cursed, but, you know, he has the, the issue of his progenitor, his effectively his grandfather or father, depending on you want to look at it. Um, Deathwing, Neltharion. Mm -hmm. A lot of what's going on in this expansion is because of stuff Neltharion did in the past. And a lot of uh, Rathion's life has been lived in the shadow of Deathwing. We saw that when in Pandaria, and yeah, it's been a few years now, but he's finally has some time to sit and kind of contemplate his life and what he's going to be. And you you get to see a piece of that. And I think that's pretty cool. That's that's one of the things that stood out to me. Christie's always a great writer. That's not nothing to do with that. It's just uh, some of the themes are in, are interesting in a way that they have not been in previous. This, this is the the closest view of Rathion as Rathion from Rathion's perspective that we've gotten yet. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that's one of the more interesting points about the the short story is that Rathion as a character has, I don't want to say has been very one dimensional, but has been sort of nonstop go from the time that we, you know, saw him hatch, essentially. Um, and you're right that there's 
a lot of living in the the shadow of his progenitor, and we'll call it that. I think it would be the 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 most uh, neutral way of saying that. Uh, but you know, it's a legacy that is is pretty terrible, all things considered. Um, but I think two things are really important about this book or this little short story. One, Chrissy Golden's writing, like you said, is always fantastic, but it's because of her care when she's doing characterization, when she's giving characters depth. And two, that's exactly what this book or this short story, I'm going to keep calling it a book, this novella did. Uh, It is giving more characterization to a character that one is pretty beloved by the fan base. I think at this point, everybody loves their, their child in this regard. Um, but it's, it's interesting to finally see him. I don't want to say be human cause he's a dragon, but to show like sort of the inner workings, his mentality and to show a certain vulnerability because Rathion, like many of the dragons out there is very much about showing up a front of what they want you to see. Uh, and in this case, in his case, particularly, because he doesn't have a choice because of the legacy of the Black Dragon flight before him, right? He needs to be strong and, and all these other things, which has led him to make very poor choices and, you know, certain other things. But it's he doesn't want to show vulnerability around other folks. And it's interesting to see little cracks in the armor, as it were. So it opens up with essentially what is Rathion calling himself the Earth Warder, the aspect of the Black Dragon flight. Now... At first glance, people would start to think that maybe this is some offshoot or an alternate storytelling, but we find out that it is a reoccurring dream. It is something that is hanging over him because it's his legacy, right? It's something that he's talked about in game. It's something that we've seen him hint at in books where he is looking for a way forward for the Black Dragonflight. And for the longest time, he thought he was all alone until he met Ebonhorn. Because all the other black dragons were either completely corrupted or scattered off. I think there's some maybe potentially still an outlet. But I thought it was an interesting opening because it showed a, a deep-seated vulnerability that I don't think we've seen before. But it also shows his his hopes and dreams. What did you think about that open? I mean, it was your standard bad dream to establish, you know, this is what Rathion's problem is. This is what his inner turmoil is. What I liked about it wasn't necessarily, it it wasn't doing anything, you know, groundbreaking. I just liked that it basically finally showed you the thing we saw. We saw in in Pandaria when we did the thing to to get the uh, legendary cloak. One of the quests is Rathion facing off against the, uh, I want to say Nizao. And as a result of it, seeing like Deathwing appears to them. And is basically the same thing we see here. Where he's like, I'm not like you. I'm nothing like you. I liked getting the chance to see, you know, he's he's really just a kid. He is young. He's, I mean, a, he's been, a kid that's been saddled with a lot of responsibility, even inadvertently. Yeah. And, and he took a lot of it on himself. And, you know, he talks about his plan to make the Horde and Alliance fight to determine which one was stronger. And how it turns out, well, that doesn't actually a great idea. That It was unity they needed, not conflict and that almost felt like blizzard going oops yeah our bad uh battle for azeroth didn't go the way we hoped um not sure if that was intentional or just you know me reading it that way but i liked the idea of rathion realizing i i have not always known the answer i'm not always right about this i also liked the fact that it le- segued into he still lives in pandaria yeah he's still in the same inn that he was in back then. And that's interesting because it implies that he feels alienated enough that he wants to live in a place that no black dragon ever lived before. So he doesn't have to worry about it. Like they don't have any expectations of him. They don't, and, you know, and Del- Deathwing, Neltharian, all that stuff doesn't mean anything to them. Yeah. That that's really the big thing, right? Cause he it's the summer's rest in, in Pandaria is where he's been holed up. Uh, which is should be familiar to anybody who spent any time in Pandaria, but that that is a really good point. It's there's no there's no baggage, there's no we remember Deathwing, we remember what he did to the world, we remember Black Dragons are bad. There's none of that, and there's no judgment. Uh, I believe the um, Mifan is the proprietor of the inn, mm-hmm. treats Rathion with just kindness and deference, not in a 
you know, he's an imperious tyrant kind of way and I must no, appease his general, whims. General respect for somebody staying at your inn. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think there's some play there too with the, he's been there for so long at this point because it's been, I mean, what it's been Pandaria was how long ago it, technically in game terms at this point. I had five to it. I don't know, man. <laughs> so probably close to maybe eight, nine, ten years, somewhere in that range. And it's been a while. Yep. Yeah. So he's been there that entire time. You get to know somebody. You get to you get to understand some of the the bits that aren't spoken out loud. Like in this case, he wakes up from the nightmare. He wakes up, uh, s- struggles, and re- you know, comes to and realizes where he's at, and then almost immediately. Uh, there's a knock at the door, right? There's no, there's no shouting. There's no kicking down the door. It's just a gentle knock at the door where Mifan comes in, has breakfast basically ready for him, looks at the room, looks at it laden with just, uh, you know, pure detritus, empty booze bottles, which is another interesting thing. I didn't realize that dragons could get drunk, but apparently that's a thing that can happen. Uh, I mean, it seems like to imply that their visage isn't just a visage. Yeah. That they are actually changing physical shape into the thing in question. And there's some reason he gets drunk off of a glass of arc wine. Well, yeah, there's some reinforcement of that later, not just with him, but with others as well. Right. Yeah. Um, And obviously they they must eat and you would think that a dragon would have to eat a ton, but like, you know, rice cakes, tea and buns is enough for him to be sated for now. So there is some interesting physiological change that's going on there. Yeah. But also let's be upfront. He's got a teenager's room. He does. Just with more booze. Crap, crap tossed everywhere. I mean, I was a teenager. I had booze in my room. But I, I said was... more booze. I didn't say no booze. <laughs> but regardless, um, yeah, there's an interesting aspect to that. I also like that he's generally already, even before he goes to it, he's already like, I don't want to go to this wedding thing. They're all going to be happy. Everyone's going to have found somebody. There's nobody for me. I'm the only black dragon I know, except for like Ebonhorn. And it's not like, I'm going to date him. Uh, you know, so it was kind of, it was interesting. It was interesting to see in a way, the fact that it was a relatively melancholy um, teenage thought made him seem more relatable. Cause it, in a moment where he's not trying to present himself as this fantastic, amazing thing, he sits there and he's like, yeah, this is, this is going to be it. I just get to watch people. I can't even find the dragon isles. I've been trying to find them for years and I can't find them. So yeah, that was, that was interesting there. Yeah. And I think it's also interesting too, because like you realize that he has been searching for a while for the dragon. Isles. we knew that as much. We knew, we knew as much from what he said in game and what we know from, from the novels, but we didn't understand why it was so important to him. And we still don't necessarily understand the why of it outside of maybe it is tied into that reoccurring dream or nightmare and that that overshadowing legacy that Deathwing has laid upon the Black Dragonflight, which is, if I can find this mysterious place, I can find out what happened, why why he got corrupted, why he made that deal, or if it was a deal at all, and I can avoid becoming him. Because like a teenager who's been raised in a, a, a bad environment, one of the things, and, and this maybe hit a little too close to home for her, for, for me and probably some other readers is, you know, this vow to never become their parent. Right. And it's, it's sort of like this ever looming thing. And it's the, the tug and, and, and flow between nurture and nature, but eventually he does relent and he goes and decides that he is going to actually attend uh, the wedding of the two horde uh, leaders of Lothamar and Thorissa, which happens to be at the Lunastre estate, uh, where it is actually pretty chock full of both factions, with one noted exception. Um, would you like to talk about that part of it at all, Matt? I mean, the Niles don't show up. They were apparently invited, which is rich. Um, both, I mean, for sure there were blood elves there, and, and even Hiles. if there weren't any actual... No, there were blood elves uh, when they went attacked, um, sorry, dude, I'm talking about when they attacked, uh, Oh Darnassus. yeah. yeah. So, sorry. Sorry. When, when the Darnassus was attacked, there were absolutely blood elves in the army. Uh, I didn't see any Nightborn, mm-hmm. but there were definitely blood elves there. And then you invite them to your wedding after how many people did you kill? Wow. 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 Um, and meanwhile, 
the night elves don't come, obviously, you know, the idea that they invited them was astonishing to me, but it's also stated that the, the tension between the night elves and the rest of the Alliance is still there too. And they're off somewhere doing something and nobody knows what it is. Now we um, maybe have we a, saw at the end of, we saw at the end of a, uh, Shadowlands, one possible thing they might be doing. There's uh, so go ahead. I was gonna say there's a couple things that might be there. The the one is I think what we got from the uh this is a slight spoiler for upcoming stuff inside of the expansion. There was some data mine dialogue that uh indicates that there might be a way to get Ysera back, but at a particular cost, and that there would be a ritual of some sort involved. And that may be something that they are trying to deal with or do. And that might be the event of which they're talking because Yasera is sort of a, a, a very important figure for in particular, the night elves and how close they are with, you know, nature and, and, and having all sort of that, that relationship with the green dragon flight and why Yasera died in the first place is also very important, especially to the elves because she died so that Malfurion would live, essentially. She essentially traded her life for his. And there's an indication that they might be looking to balance the scales. We don't know too much about it outside of what's been data mined, but it is something that is rather important. Was that what you were referring to, Matt, or was there something else? No, not even close. Uh, I was talking about the deal the Winter Queen gave Taranda. Uh, a, a, I'm not sure. I don't remember if it was a seed or not. It was uh, a new tier end, of a loon. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of uh, Shadowlands, the Winter Green gave Taranda a new thing saying this can help your people rebuild. So they may have been using that somewhere to rebuild. Uh, I don't know if it means that Teldrassil will come back or if it just means that they are going to have someplace else. But based on the way that it seems like uh, Blizzard is going with it, I would not be surprised if Teldrassil came back at this point. Um, because, like, you know, having the Forsaken retake Lordaeron. Although they did that in game, uh, it, it does feel a little bit like we're, we're trying to kind of pretend that the stuff didn't happen or maybe not pretend it didn't happen, but show them attempting to rebuild afterwards. So I don't know. Um, but it's been, you know, during the three year period after the end of Shadowlands, the Night Elves have been distant. They're still upset with the Alliance for not helping them during Battle for Azeroth. Uh, they don't feel like they got fair treatment and they're even less happy with the Horde. Uh, to put it mildly, and I don't blame them. It's this is the biggest problem I have with the true storyline is eventually something has to be done about that. The instigating incident of of everything still needs to be addressed, and it's not like the horde can just point to Sylvanas and go, "She did it," because they, you know, Sylvanas gave the order, but they're the ones who carried it out, and that's that is something that's going to have to be dealt with. I don't know how it will be dealt with. Um, and I, I, in fact, I don't think much of it will be dealt with in this new expansion, and I don't expect it to be. Uh, but, but yeah, they're not there. However, uh, Turalyon and Alaria both go. Mm -hmm. uh, Rathion says some things indicating that it looks like Turalyon and Alaria have kind of resumed the affectionate portion of their relationship, which they've been kind of less than in recent years. They, they still seem to be by each other, but they don't. There wasn't a lot of you know we're a married couple going on. Well, As I mean, there's Rathion been... himself points out, you know, a thousand years of war. Maybe, maybe you forget how to do that kind of thing. Well, not only that, but it's a thousand years of war, but also everything that happened between the two of them with uh, Turalyon essentially becoming light forged uh, and, you know, her essentially accepting the void and founding the void elves for more or less like those two are diametrically opposed. And don't forget, like the battle, the, the sort of battle of wills that happened with uh between Zera and her essentially in the, it was the short story, a thousand years of war um, mm -hmm. where like there was definitely strain on the relationship as a result of it. Cause Trillian was very much trusting in the direction of the Naru and the light and was very happy to kind of move forward. And she wasn't. And you know, at one point she was basically locked in her room under house arrest. That's going to put a strain on any marriage when your husband's basically going, yeah, sure. No, just go ahead and lock my wife up. That's fine. Yeah, no, no, that makes perfect sense. We're good. Like, yeah. So they've been, and that's been a strain on their relationship very clearly. The fact that they are, they've always been by each other's side, like Matt pointed out, because, well, they're on the, they're all part of the same side, for lack of a better term. Um, they're on the Alliance's side. They're still trying also, to fight though, for Azeroth. 
Yeah, I also want to point out that this is the first time we've seen them and Arator actually together. Yes. Not just in some flashback to like an evil possible future, you know, that Nizoth is giving you, but literally Arator is there with them as their, you know, family, as the three of them are a family unit. And that's interesting. It's doubly interesting because they bring Arator to essentially a, a blood elf nightborn marriage. Mm-hmm. This is the most elf he's ever gotten to see. Like, you know, Arator has spent most of his life dealing with, you know, outer space stuff and, you know, war against the Legion. And this was the most elfy elf thing he's ever going to get to see in his life. You know, so that and was not, interesting. And not only that, it's a, it's a rare opportunity for him to get to interact with a lot of people and potentially people in his same age group, which we'll get into in a little bit as well. That, uh, well, I wouldn't say his war. own age group. I would say, I don't know, peers. Peers. Uh, but definitely not age yeah. group because the main person Arator gets to hang out with is Dagon Thorison the second and Dagon Thorison the second is like 10. <laughs> you know, so it's not quite his age group. Uh, even, even counting for the fact that Arator is an elf or half elf. Um, he's been around for at least 30 something years, which for, again, for half elf, not that big a deal, but it is, it was him being nice to a young kid. It wasn't him hanging out with somebody who will become a lifelong buddy. But I mean, you never know. Uh, but they, they might could. become friends, but I'm just saying that at that moment in time, it was like, wow, this is a neat book here. You can look at my knife, which I mean, you know, what's Arator got to show people besides, you know, I've lived in continuous war against the forces of evil since I was a child. I don't have any pastimes. And they weren't the only ones that are there. And we can talk about more about them as well, but there was a, uh... no, there are a ton. Go ahead. List some of your faves. Uh, for me, I'm going to be up front Bane and Mela. Yeah. Oh yeah. 100%. Uh, but I mean, we got to see actually like Thrall doing family things, essentially Thrall brought not only his, his wife, Agra, he brought his two children, Durak and Rez, uh, which I think that's the first time we've been given their names. I'm, I'm questioning this. Durak. I know we had Durak's name somewhere else, uh, in a story or something, but this is the first time I've heard, we've heard his, uh, his second child, the daughter's name. So but, that's cool. But it's nice to see them, you know, out and about and Agra actually to be there. Although I would have liked maybe a scene with Agra. Uh, that would have been, would have been a little bit nice. I always enjoyed her as a character. I would like to, at some point we get a scene of Agra saying to Thrall, what was that? And he's like, I got kidnapped. I didn't go by my, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause you, 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 you go missing for a while. Your wife doesn't just be like, Oh, where were you? Yep. She's like, what, what did you go on another adventure without me? We talked about this. No, no, I didn't. I did not go on an adventure. I was kidnapped by an evil banshee. Drekthar already said he would babysit the kids. We are going to go on an adventure together. It's fine. This wasn't on choice. (laughs) If you could have come through, I totally would have been down for it. It wasn't a boy's trip. I'm not doing that again. Uh, Queen Talanji showing up, obviously, was a a, a good... I I love that character. Um, The interesting thing was that Zakan was her plus one, uh, which was... A mostly just interesting. Uh, I don't know if that will mean anything later, but it's a thing that happened. Uh, Rokan showed up as well. Uh, like you said, uh, Bane and Mela, which are two of my absolute favorite characters. I love those two in the way they interact with each other. Uh, if you haven't done the in-game like pre-expansion stuff yet, uh, you should go ahead and do it, especially uh, the direct fear uh, starting area just for if nothing else the payoff of uh, Bane coming back and interacting with with Mela at the gates of Orgrimmar uh, it is just a wonderful of uh, the interaction between the two is absolutely wonderful uh, we get Lillian Voss comes back with uh, Kalia and uh, Derek Proudmore who is now Kalia's champion which is interesting mm-hmm. we we knew that he was going to be going with her because he is forsaken now um, but him being chosen as essentially her champion is really, really, uh, it's an interesting development. Also the fact that, uh, why can I not remember her name now? Uh, wow. Uh, from Kultiris. Oh, Tal- Talia for dragon. Talia. There we go. Wow. I just kept wanting to say Thalia over and over and over again. Uh, but Talia like openly embraces them essentially upon seeing them. Like there is no, animosity immediately between the two of them, which I thought was very, very touching and interesting. Like Derek Proudmore, who, you know, is essentially a forsaken now was 
warmly greeted by Talia. No hemming, no hawing, nothing like that. Uh, we also got to see uh, Matthias Shaw and Flynn Fair, uh, Fairwind, which was mm-hmm. always an absolutely beloved uh, beloved grouping. And then, of course, Caligos was there. I think I caught everybody. <laughs> and then Caligos was there. Well, Cal- well, Caligos. No, is, I like Caligos, Caligos but I, I liked. I did like that Caligos was trying to pump Talia for information about Jaina. Oh, of course. And J- Talia's like, "Nah, she's just busy. I'm, you know, dude. I'm, I'm not telling you about your ex." And yeah. most surprisingly, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to gloss this over, even though it was sort of glossed over a little bit in the story. Anduin was there. Was he? Yep. Anduin, the King of Stormwind. Him. He gets mentioned. I don't think at any I'm point. Pretty sure. He's there. I'm pretty I just sure. Read this just like an hour ago, and I do not remember him actually being there. I remember Rathion thinking about him and saying that when he comes back, he hopes to, uh, you know, repair their relationship. But I don't think he was there. The way it was mentioned, maybe I read it wrong, uh, but I thought it made mention that he might have been potentially there. Because either way, it's a it's a one line thing, but I think it's interesting that uh, you know, I mean, this is something that Anduin would have wanted, right? And that's sort of the thought. Yeah, that was the narrative in Rathion's head is about how you know Anduin had long f- argued that there could be peace between the Alliance and the Horde. Mm-hmm. But those are all in attendance, uh, and they're they're sitting down, and they're they're the well, Rathian- obviously we should point out that Talisra and and, and Lorthamar were also there, as was Haldor and Brightblade and Ramath. Ramath which, showed up too, which we and should- Lady Leadrin was officiating. So yes. you know, there you go. There's your elf group. Uh, but it's interesting because Rathian tries to come at the tail end of the ceremony and gets to see them actually exchanging uh, of vows. Uh, and of course, as would be expected, uh, Lothamar and Theresa give their vows in and basically uh, prose. Right? They're they're giving them out in in poetry because that is essentially what their relationship sort of blossomed from. I shouldn't say blossomed; the seed was already there, but sort of like solidified and crystallized and sort of took took form was when they were challenged when they were challenging each other to a a cultural battle of poetry and then they realized that now there's something here but it was I think nice blossom was fine for that mm-hmm. i don't think you should have you they, they've been using blossom to mean that for literally centuries i think you were doing okay fair enough uh but i think it's interesting trust it, yourself joe <laughs> but i think it's just nice to see two characters actually being able to openly express their feelings with each other, because that's something that doesn't happen a lot in Warcraft where like characters may be involved with each other, but it's always like furtive glances or it's complicated or, you know, maybe it's a trench warfare love thing where we were in battle together. So there you go. Uh, But it's nice to just see them genuinely happy and, and, you know, being there and sort of sharing that love, not only with their closest friends, but with people that would have maybe been considered former allies and possibly now, or, and definitely former enemies. Uh, but it was a nice little tiny ceremony. And then, of course, it rolls right into the uh, reception, which is where things get a little more interesting. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Matt talk for a little while. Mowage. Two of. Sorry, I just had to. <laughs> Uh, the reception is actually kind of interesting because like, like Joe, Joe and I have already kind of talked, talked upon the major, uh, things. Uh, we forgot the bronze beards who are all there. Uh, we didn't mention that. Oh, yes. Dagan, all of, there, but, all uh, three of the bronze beard siblings plus Moira. Yeah. There's Magni, AKA diamond head. Uh, then there's, uh, his two brothers, um, whose names I cannot remember at the moment for some reason, even though I've been working, writing about this game and have written, you know, your lords about every single one of them. Uh, well, then of course, one is, what is Bran? Yeah, Bran and Muradin. Yeah, Bran Muradin and Magni are all there. Magni mm-hmm. still a diamond. Uh, also with them is Moira, and with Moira is her son Dagrin. So Rathian doesn't get to meet Dagrin uh, because Dagrin is off actually having a competition of not really a competition. There's just he's given his book that he's been reading over to Arator. Um, the personification of Dagrin Tharason as being a bookworm has continued. Uh, the dude likes to read. Um, and Arator is like, well, I don't have a book, but here, you can hold my knife. I've st- stabbed things with it. And that's the two of them are like, wow, this is a really cool knife. I could stab things too. I don't just have to read. There's also room for stabbing. And, uh, you know, Arator is like, yeah, that's a nice book. Uh, pretty heavy. I could probably kill someone with this. Uh, and we get a brief interchange with uh, Rathion, you know, getting to meet them all and being like, you know, it's it's good to finally meet you. And we know that all uh, three have been exploring Northrend, which is interesting. Yes. 
And uh, I believe that's going to be the book Exploring Northrend, which is coming out in a couple of months. Yes. Um, but also, uh, one of the things I liked about the entire reception is how Rathion is trying really hard to be genial, but he knows, sure, he's respected as having helped save the world from Nazoth, but people are afraid of him because he is a black dragon. And if you know anything about black dragons, you know that Deathwing was the head of the black dragons, and the black dragons have been basically uh, the bad guys for a long time. And so he's like sitting there kind of, he kind of has that in his head. I think the story moves, sets up through him moving through the various people he talks to. He has a nice exchange with Caligos, which leads into another nice exchange with Caligos later. Um, there's his inner monologue about what he's been doing with his life and how he shouldn't have come there. He should just let his spies watch it. And that moves into a brief discussion with Caligos because Caligos is one of the people he asked if he knew anything about the Dragon Isles. And Caligos is like, unfortunately, no, I, they, we left there before I was even born. I don't know anything about them. Uh, well, we should probably we, talk we about the, the, the Bane and, and Mila stuff first. Like when he is interacting. No, with them, because right? the, no, there's the first Caligos conversation, not the second one. Cause remember he talks to Caligos and then he moves on and then he talk, has the Bane and Mila thing. And then he talks to Caligos again after that. Trust me, this happens. Okay. Uh, the first conversation is brief. It's just about. You know, did you talk to, you know, who did you talk to about it? And he's like, well, I tried Chromie, but she said she did know where they were, but then she didn't. And then it was confusing. Um, then I, so I then talked to Alex Straza, even though the Red Dragon Flight had my egg locked up and uh, we're not on the best of terms. But for some reason, Alex Straza was nice to me, as she always is for some odd reason that I don't understand. Hint, it's because she's nice. Um, and then he goes over and talks to Mela and Bane. And the Mela and Bane conversation, do you want to talk about that one? Sure. Uh, so what happens with Mela and Bane is probably one of the more interesting things. So uh, he runs into them, uh, basically starts talking with them. Uh, you basically it's worth, pointing out, it's worth pointing out Bane calls to him. Yes. And he says, I am surprised and pleased to see you chose to attend uh, in which uh, you have Rathian doing his his normal smarmy. Yes, well, the guest list called for Azeroth's best, best and brightest. Uh, they laughed, he drank, and Mela slipped her arm into Bane's, and the High Chieftain covered it. Rathian had to fight the impulse to dash his glass to the ground. Uh, basically confirming what people were suspecting, that the two of them had been involved in some form of uh, romantic relationship, or at least the budding uh, version of one. Uh, so they are definitely intertwined with each other in some capacity. Um and this is sort of a, a bittersweet moment for, for Rathion. He enjoys that Bane is happy. He He's not like bitter about that part of it, but it's, he, he knew that it would be a wedding and that everybody would be happy and that there'd be this inescapable uh, sense of belonging and love and connection, like some sort of cheerful uh, blight rising to engulf everyone, smother them with cozy con con uh, contentment. Uh, everyone, of course, except for him. Uh, and then a random Torn that decides to show up. This is sort of important. So a black furred, uh, white markings on his muzzle. Torn shows up wearing uh, shamanic robes with a staff, not even remotely close to dressed formally. Uh, and he's basically staring directly at Rathion. Uh, and then Rathion points this out to Bane and says, is this one of yours? And Bane follows the gaze and says, nope, that's Kurog, one of Magtha Grimtotem's uh, folks. And you can see that there's still that, for good reason, Bane still has a healthy distrust and dislike of the Grim Totems after everything that they've went through and everything that they've they've done to uh, the Blood Hoofs and the Torrens in general. Um, so there's this exchange where essentially Krog is staring at Rathion and basically saying, you are an unnatural abomination. You should not be. You should not exist on this world. Uh, and he keeps talking about you were made, cobbled together out of pieces of corpses. You and your depraved kin, you are the very symbol of all that has gone wrong with this world. So the Grim Totem has basically gotten up on their high horse a little bit and talking about the unnatural or natural uh, order of things. And this is kind of a, an interesting callback and we're we're going to get back to that in a second, but a little bit of a uh, scuffle, we'll say, ensures between uh, the two of them, where Rathion snaps his his wine glass in hand, uh, sending shards into it, 
runs up, lunges forward, grabs the shaman by his robe, lifting him as if he weighs nothing, and tells him that I can incinerate you in half a heartbeat. Uh, basically, at this point, this is when Kalik comes up to him uh, and says, let him go now. And he's doing it as calmly as he can, trying to talk him down. Uh, the exchange happens, and essentially, Tharissa comes up, Lothar comes up, after they destroyed, after having their cake destroyed by this scuffle, uh, looks at them, notes that they have not invited Kurog, uh, notices that Kurog has, makes note that Kurog has gotten past their security, which also, we is interesting. That Mela is the one that when when they ask what's going on, Mela is like, uh, "This jackass came in and insulted one of your guests." Yep, he has so trespassed Mela, onto Mela your lands actually, and intruded on your celebration slowly to harass your guests. Yeah, Mela jumps right in to defend Rathion before anybody else can. So that's worth noting. Also worth noting, uh, and something that Rathion points out, how does Kurog know what he is saying? Yep. So, but this yeah, is that, that's a thing that happens. This is lead. This is also lead up for Kurog. This is lead up uh, for the Grim Totems and what's going to be happening with uh, Dragonflight in general. Right? We know a little bit about this, and there are some again some mild spoilers here. Um, the Grim Totems have always had sort of a a link to almost dark shamanism. They're not quite dark shaman, but they're pretty dang close. Um, and they've always been looking for more power because power is how you essentially secure your legacy. Magtha was always about that. There was a point where Magtha was invited into the shaman town hall, right? The, the shaman order hall. And, you know, why was she there? Because one measly artifact of immense elemental power happened to also be there. And some reason we trusted her to be around it. We said before, Matt said this, and 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 I still remember him laughing. Yep, yeah, that'll have no consequences whatsoever moving forward. Kurog is a consequence of that moving forward because they're looking for that elemental power. What's a really good way to get that? I don't know. Maybe some Home element- Depot. No, it's not Home Depot. <laughs> elemental Dragon Depot, maybe. Uh, but that's really what we're we're going to be facing in Dragonflight is sort of this uprising of these elemental dragons that oppose the Dragonflights that fought against the Titans that you know want to essentially wipe the Titan influence from the planet of the Earth or of Azeroth. Rathion is a representation of that. Rathion is like sort of the pure distillment of that, even more so than the dragon aspects. He's cobbled together. He is a laboratory baby. So. It's interesting to note that it's Kurog here that is that is present and was able to get past the guards and slip in unseen. Because here's the other thing. It wasn't just the guards of the Nightborn that were there. You know damn well the Far Striders were in effect. You know that because the Ranger General, essentially, the, the Lord Regent of the Blood Elves was getting married, that anybody who wasn't like one of his two trusted friends was on patrol. And they don't generally miss anything. Well, for that matter, I mean, Lorthamar actually literally did bring the Ranger General with him because Halder and Brayblade was his best man. Mm-hmm. And Halder and Brayblade is the Ranger General. Mm-hmm. So he brought that guy. Um, it was really, it, it. there's no way this guy should have been able to get in. Quite frankly, if it wasn't a happy occasion, they probably should have kidnapped the dude dragged him someplace and done magical stuff to his brain until they figured out what, what, what he knew and how he did it because yeah, the, the, this was definitely. So there's a, news. there's a nod to that, that I think might've been a, um, a, a potential that they might've tried or considered that because Silgrin uh, was sent after Thoris's nod to follow Kurog out of the territory <laughs> to make sure he did leave. Silgrim is also the one that makes all those lovely portals and, uh, he yeah. has access to all those wonderful arcane labs all over uh, Suramar. So that might have been part of the intention as well as find out why, how he got in or find out how he's going to get out. But the interesting thing after this is uh, it, we go back to that conversation that Matt was talking about earlier is Rathion composes himself, uh, tries to apologize to Thorissa and Lothamar. Uh, they try to assuage his guilt at having caused the scene. And they're like, no, you didn't cause the scene. It wasn't your problem. But during the exchanges, Rathion heard people in the crowd, whether he actually heard people in the crowd or not is is up for debate. Uh, But he thought he heard people agreeing with the vitriol that was being spit at him by Kurok. Now, this could be, 
you know, his own paranoia, his own, the weight of what's ever on his shoulders right now, the, the weight of living under the shadow of Deathwing that's making him believe that people are like that. Uh, but he just basically politely says, my presence is provocative to some, and I should have just gone. And so he does. He basically bows, uh, straighten his shoulders, and strode off without another word. So he finds himself at the outskirts, where uh, he finds two nightborn, uh, basically statues outside of the vineyard. Uh, and he's taking a look at him when, he, you know, he's tired and a little bit drunk. Uh, he's lamenting his the fact that it's been a dead end search of the Dragon Isles, uh, lamenting that he's been having this dream shattering his sleep and basically just feeling drained. Uh, and then he's got that haunting twinge in his chest, uh, something that during his waking moment, he's feeling something in him, something that is uh, he's trying to dull down with the wine as of late. And this is where Caligo shows up and Caligo shows up with a, a bottle of wine and two glasses and says he could use some help drinking this vintage. Rathion uh, initially starts to say no, but then says yes, pops down and the two start drinking and talking. Uh, and that's where they find out that that feeling of, of loss or that feeling of whatever it is that Rathion is feeling, Caligos has it too. They bond over the fact that they are both living in the shadow of uh, a former, the former aspects that they served doing terrible things. Cause don't forget like, yes, Deathwing was absolutely awful, but so was Malagos at the end there downright a tyrant. And the blue dragon fight is all scattered to the four winds at this point. It's almost completely dissolved after the last meeting uh, that they had. And so they share in that sort of, I don't want to say fatalistic or deterministic kinship, but Caligos of all of the dragons understands more of what Rathion's going through than any of them has the potential to. He understands what it's like to be alone. He understands what it's like to live in the shadow of, of the terrible memory of the, the one that came before you uh, to understand what it's like to have all of your friends or to feel like you are, or you're isolated and alone from everything else. And they bond over that. And, you know, Caligos reminds him, like, you helped save Azeroth. And he's like, that's not enough. And then once they realize that they both have this pain in, in, in common, it's almost like a light bulb goes over. Like, if we're feeling it, other dragons are probably feeling it, too. And so they decide that they're going to go and find Alex Straza, and they're going to go to Wormrest Temple, and they're going to see what, what is going on. So Caligos opens up a portal because, don't forget, Caligos can still do magic, and he's still a mage, even at the, the worst of times. And they teleport there. Do you want to talk about what they see when they get there? Actually, before I do, I want to talk about the conversation between Caligos Please. and uh, uh, Rathion a little bit. Because it's interesting because one of the points, like one of the interesting things about the conversation is that he, he's laying out, you know, what happened to Malagos. He goes, you know, I, I understand because, I mean, Malagos went mad and eventually tried to destroy all, all mortal spellcasters. He goes, and Rathian's like, I can tell you that you're kind because you didn't bring up that it was Neltharion that killed all of your people and, and drove him mad. And uh, they have this. It's interesting because it's, you pointed out that in a way, it's not that they have similar experiences so much as Caligos has been there. Like where Rathion is right now is where Caligos was. Like he didn't, he didn't just think about becoming the aspect. He became the aspect. He replaced his hero who turned bad, you know? Caligos was the only one who could ultimately save his dragon flight. He even had to fight Malagos's biological son to, to become aspect because he had betrayed their people and joined forces with Deathwing. So Caligos is, it's really interesting because he's not just sympathizing. He's literally like, I've been there. I have seen this. I have been through this. And I think that's one of the reasons that he gives, he gives Neltharion more, I mean, uh, Rathian more time than he might otherwise. And I think that leads into the next bit that you're going to talk about, uh, which I will talk about and then let you talk for a while. When they get to Wormrest, there are like hundreds of dragons there, which is like the biggest dragon conclave they've had in a long time. They didn't have this many dragons there when they were being attacked by, you know, the armies of the old gods. When Deathwing, they, you know, it's, it is pretty much every dragon who could reasonably get back who could possibly have some idea of what's happening and find a way back in time. So some of the blues aren't there because they're too far away. They went off. Who knows where they are, but it, just about everybody else uh, showed up 
and is like, what's going on? Why do we all feel like this? But of course, being dragons, they're they're all sitting around waiting for somebody to come tell them what, what's going on. They know that Alexstrasza is up there and they're like, well, Alexstrasza will tell us when she's ready. Except Rathian's like, I am not waiting here. <laughs> I have waited long enough. Thank you. And so he turns into a dragon and flies up and just jumps on in. This was another interesting bit because honestly, I don't know about you, but I think in the exchange between him, Nosdormu barely talks to Rathion. Nosdormu does not seem to want to interact with him in any specific way. No, like, and there there might be of, various reasons for that. And maybe yeah. the the animated shorts might lend some some thought of that. But yeah, yeah. but Alexstrasza is downright fond of him, and I think it's because he is like Naltharian was. See, I think that's going to be a part of this. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a part where we find out that, you know, it's not that Neltharion made a deal with the old gods. It's that he felt desperate and was tricked and took their power. And then it was too late to stop. Uh, and I definitely think that, that there's a, there's a, there's a thing about the way Alex Straza interacts with him. That's very gentle. Like she even touches his face and he doesn't seem to know what to do with this, but she is the, the reason that she's the dragon queen, the reason that she's the mother of dragons is because she is literally the mother of life on Azeroth. She, she has in the, in the war crimes book, she loves everybody. She even loves the orcs that trapped her and force bred her because they're, you know, she understands that they do things without a full understanding of the interconnectedness of all life. So that's, that's her. So I think she honestly straight up like thinks of Rathion as this, her brother's little boy, you know? Like it's like a like a like an impetuous, somewhat. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but like a, you know, impetuous nephew who's always a little bit in over his head. Yeah, the impetuous nephew who's not always playing with the full set of information. Yeah, like for instance, he doesn't know where the dragon isles are because you know when he asked her, she just told him they're lost to us because where they are isn't the problem. They couldn't find them if they wanted to. They were sealed, so you could go to the place where they're supposed to be, but you weren't going to find them. But now. Now you can go there. And that's the, 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 the gist of what's been going on with all the dragons is that sensation they're feeling is it's inside them. It's like a homing instinct telling them that the dragon isles are back. They're open. You can go there now. And every dragon is feeling it. So that was interesting too. I thought, yeah, I really liked that. I liked that exchange too. Like I liked the idea that uh, for lack of a better term, dragons have a built-in homing beacon, (laughs) which I think is kind of, it's kind of interesting, but it makes a certain amount of sense, right? Like we talked about last week with Tyr and the raising of the dragon, the proto drakes into the dragon aspects. And then as a result, the flights uh, being born from them being uh, exposed to the font of order, essentially, that uh, Tyr had created, which we know is is up there in Tyr's hold. We know that that's, that's where it is. And if that's the source of essentially their second life, having something hard coded into the genetics that says I'm active again, come, come home makes a lot of sense. And the way that it is explained in that very gentle, very uh, almost loving way from, from Alex Straza, like, no, you're homesick. Like you have to understand, like this is something we've all been waiting for. The dragon isles are calling to us. They are inviting us home. And Rathian doesn't understand this because for the longest time he didn't have a home. The the Summer's Rest Inn really wasn't it was his home, but it wasn't home. He was it wasn't isolated. His home. It was his base of operations. Yeah, he didn't have a home because he didn't have a life. And he that's you know he didn't he himself belong. Says that. Yeah, he himself even says this. He's like you know I I what time did I have for like being a child for you know the things that a young whelp would go through? I didn't have time. You know. I was like, can you imagine being like, you know, two or three years old and deciding uh, I'm going to pit two of the most powerful, you know, blocks of nations on the planet together in combat to see which one of them I'm going to pick to be the ones that save Azeroth at two, mm-hmm. even as a dragon. That's, that's a bit precocious. Um, and he himself, even this story, he's like, yeah, that wasn't the right way to go. I was wrong. I should have done that. So it's, it's fascinating. I, I like I like the acceptance though too that that Rathion has because in that moment he realizes like the light bulb goes on the the puzzle pieces fall into place and he was being welcomed he belonged he 
uh, like the rest of the quote unquote real dragons, his homing beacon activated and he was being called home. He knew now that that hurt in his chest was, it wasn't hurt. It was something calling him and that, that loss became exaltation it became a, a jubilant revelation uh, that the dragon without a flight, the one that had his recurring nightmare, you know, that, that told him that he had this legacy of being excluded, of being the outcast, of being, you know, forced to become exactly what Deathwing became or what Naltharian became in Deathwing had the power to transform. He saw it not, he, he didn't see his dream anymore as a inevitable fall to darkness, but a challenge uh, to basically rail against that. And that now if he went home, he could potentially find out how to have a dragon flight again, how to have a flight of his own peers and people and, and family beyond just the, the reds and the greens and the blues and the bronzes. He can maybe relaunch the black dragon flight free of the corruption, free of the deal that was made uh, by, by Naltharion, free of the curse of Deathwing, and he can help guide his flight to their future. And he makes a promise, and that promise is something he intends to keep. And I think it's a really, really cool, really important character growth moment for him because he has purpose. He's not fighting the Legion anymore. He's not running around trying to, um, you know, second play Alliance versus uh, versus Horde. He's not trying any weird schemes. He just wants to go home and he wants to he wants to have what was denied to his people, essentially, is what it boils down to. And I think it sets it up pretty beautifully. Anything up? I agree with you. <laughs> I just, just felt like that uh, you were stand, sitting there going, okay, so I'm supposed to say something here, but I already said pretty much everything. So, yes, that's true. And I'm turning to an invisible camera that's not here because we're, we're doing this via microphones. Like, But, I mean, I do think that that's interesting. There's there's tantalizing hints here of what we might see. There's the fact that Nosdormu is, like, keeping distant and not – has never had time for Atheon at all. Would, like, just won't meet with him. Why? Like, you know, I can see him not particularly being interested in Rathion, but why would you just not talk to him at all? Um, or, uh, you know, even just have somebody in your flight say, you know, um, like my wife, have your wife talk to it if you don't want to. But he just didn't. And and even now, it feels like he's almost deliberately not learning very much about Rathion. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and I, when you know that at some point in the future, you might end up turning into somebody evil. Although I do have a theory about that, but go ahead. Oh, I want to hear your theory. Actually, I was just—I was going to ask you if you had a theory. About that. Well, okay. Do you remember Avengers Forever, the Kurt Busiek uh, Avengers story? Yeah, the big one. One of the things about that that was interesting to me was that Kang was always going to be like turn into a Mortis in the future. He always knew this that mm -hmm. I, you know someday he would turn into a Mortis, and therefore he was always like kind of half. From the moment he found out, he was kind of just like half doing his stuff because he was always like aware that at some point this awful fate waited for him. In a way, Nosdormu and and, and uh, Rathion have a very similar issue, except that Nosdormu knows it's going to happen because he has seen the guy. You know, he has seen Murazond. He's watched Murazond die. So he knows what's going to happen to him. But what if, without really realizing it, when he gave up his aspect power, he broke it. And that's why when you go into, uh, in case you don't know, the Oldamon Legacy of Tear Dungeon, spoilers for it if you haven't done it yet, uh, when you go in there, there's a quest to essentially find the, a disc inside of again and has memories of Tear, but a member of the Infinite Dragonflight prevents you from getting it. Mm -hmm. And they want it to turn Nosdormu they want Murazond to be the one true aspect. There will be no other aspects, just Murazond. And we, the thing is, we know Murazond dies because we killed them. Yep. But what if when they, when they gave up their aspect powers, what if when they divested themselves of all Titan granted gifts in order to essentially lock Deathwing's death as a fixed point in time, for lack of a better word, what if Nor Nosdormu made it so he doesn't turn into Murazond because his no, no, he no longer has that connection to the power the Titans gave him. He no longer has knowledge of his future and therefore he can't be sure it's going to happen. I mean, he was before, 
But what if he isn't now? And what if because of that, it's possible for Murazon to come into existence without Nosdormu being the one to do it? Yeah, there's there's that element of that that I think is, I think we also throw that sort of into whack as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because we, like I keep thinking about it, like, what if we've gone to an alternate timeline where things were just slightly different mm-hmm. uh, in, in uh, World of Zedranor, and we met all these beings that were, I mean, that was Goldon just as much as the Goldon we knew, but it wasn't. It was it was still a different Goldon at the same time and that it we, was Goldon. And we know that the bronze dragon flight and by extension the infinite dragon flight can open up channels between realities because literally that's how Warlords of Draenor happens. Yeah, Kairos went there. Yep. Yep. And we know from Shadowlands, or at least from some of the stuff people like Steve Dinuser said, that the people in sh- you know, the, the the beings you meet in Shadowlands are like common th- peels off of a thread that is that being's essence. Like the other Gul'dan and the original Gul'dan that we knew of were both part of a, like a single continuum of Gul'dan, like a single, you know, branching thread. And that means you could have one Norse Dorm go off and become Murazond while another doesn't. Yeah. Like, and our, our, you know, our Norse Dorm that's there in the future with us, he may turn into, to, to Murazond, but the Norse Dorm who's going to show up at the end of the expansion to be the end boss doesn't. And alongside the other really strangely familiar people, we're going to end up fighting them inside of the end time at, from the other direction. And they're going to win and kill Murazond and save the world and beat us. The The interesting thing about that, too, is that um, the dream from that Rathion keeps having specifically happens at the Caverns of Time. That why? is correct. Why is yeah. that? Why is that a thing? What is the significance of there? Because Deathwing never got there. That was never it never it never seemed to be part of the time. And it also is very central to the bronze dragon flight. It has been forever. We've seen it. They've used it to send us places uh, multiple, multiple times uh, in order to correct things or make sure things happen. Um, it's one of those interesting things that that if it ends with Norse Damu and Murazond, maybe that's the significance of it. Right, maybe that's why it's so present in Rathion's mind. So I think it's going to be interesting too to see how a lot of this shakes out. But to not to get into the weeds on that one, I know everybody at home would love to hear us do that, but we're kind of running out of time here. So I just want to loop back to the story. The story gave us the setup for why the dragons know where the dragon owl are. We know that that they're going to be heading home. We know why they're heading home. We got to see a little bit of the interplay between. Uh, the different factions, at least a little bit, and seeing that some of the tension over the last several years has started to not dissipate completely because there is definitely some friction still there, but at least lessen. Lessen to the There's point. There's an actual effort from both sides to not do anything to make it worse. Like you see, like you know, Teralian, who is a military figure, he is a general. He is not a statesman. Understands that you know. I will go to this thing and I will make nice and I won't, you know, mention any of the stuff that, you know, happened between us because the whole point of this is in order to get past the stuff that happened between us, we have to let it end. Like there's, there's a whole thing about that. You know, what's the, the saying, the eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Yep. If you know, yes, things have happened, but if we don't let it go and try and move on from it, then we'll just be fighting a fifth war in a few years. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. That Teralian of all people seems to understand the importance of what they're doing. Except for, you know, Ken Graymain, who didn't couldn't be arsed to show up. Yeah, Mia went. <laughs> I don't close enough. Gen is Gen's never gonna like the people that no. you know he blames for killing his son. So. No. But I think that's gonna do it unless there's anything else you want to add, Matt. Yeah, I, I wanted uh Mila and Bane to make out. That's what I would have added. <laughs> I think that's not Bane's style. Bane's a much more subtle uh, Torin than that. Mm, I think that, you know, they could, they don't have to make out in front of everybody. They could just go off somewhere and make out. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you're asking me what I wanted, man. And you're all, he wouldn't do that. Like, then why ask me? <laughs> My fanfic's going to have lots of make outs. <laughs> well, uh, stay tuned for, for whenever Matt decides to get around to those. Cause I'm sure they will be absolutely glorious. In the meantime, blizzard watch is made possible due to generous contributions at patreon.com slash blizzard watch. Your continued support means this podcast signing community is able to thrive and grow. Blizzard watch supporters enjoy exclusive benefits like early access to the podcast, a better chance at having your question answered on our podcast or the queue and an ad free site experience. 
Again, folks, if you have any questions for this podcast or any of our podcasts, send them into podcast at blizzardwatch.com or one of our various channels. Please send them in. We're running low on questions for this show. And more Lillian is always Voss welcome. Lillian Voss is totally making out with Kelly at the same time. Maybe. Not in the same place, but at the same time. <laughs> All right. But with that, folks, we'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.